initial case of walking robots that we showed last time, the initial examples are uh, quite enough for us to justify these methods. And I hope you'll see, and I'll give a few examples of how they're more generally applicable uh, for skateboards or for convey cranes and, and, and things like this. Okay, so, um, you know, last time there were two big ideas, I guess, uh, new ideas, right? One was about introducing limit cycle stability. These are the two pieces. Okay, and limit cycle stability is orbital stability of a periodic cycle, of a, of a periodic motion. You can have orbital stability of a of a non-periodic trajectory too, right? There's, those things are slightly different, right? If I want to say that this trajectory, which never goes back, um, if I talk about its orbital stability, I could still say that this thing, the, the distance between my solution and that trajectory goes to zero independent of time. Orbital stability does not require periodicity, but orbital stability plus periodicity is the stability of a limit cycle. Okay, so that was one idea that we needed. And I guess the second big idea was, um, you know, hybrid dynamics or contact dynamics, hybrid models of contact. And this is one of the ways to model contact. Uh, I think it's particularly favorable for trajectory optimization type codes. Um, I realize I didn't, I said, I said we were doing hybrid but I didn't fully land why is it called hybrid. Um, you know, it wasn't essential, I guess, to the, the point, but let me just make sure it's, it's clear why the models we started talking about last time with impulsive collisions are, tend to be called hybrid models, right? Hybrid models, you model the dynamics in continuous modes in continuous time modes, so it's um, punctuated by discrete events. And this mixture of continuous time and discrete time is why we, we call it hybrid, they're called them hybrid. Hybrid's a hopelessly overloaded word. You could have gas and electric motors and that's a high, but um, in, con in control, it tends to be continuous time and discrete time. Um, <clears throat> okay. So in the rimless wheel, for instance, right, we talked about having our rimless wheel here where we modeled the stance dynamics. continuous, right? They were actually just the dynamics of the simple pendulum, upside down, but the dynamics of the pendulum, plus discrete, impulsive, inelastic in that case. Collisions, which were the events. So I've got a completely continuous system. At the instant where the foot hits the ground, I model a discrete event, which changes, which stops that foot from coming, um, going through the ground. And I also take that opportunity to reset the coordinate system and rewrite the dynamics now around this new stance foot. So the definition of theta changed and I moved down the ramp and gained some energy, okay? So there's cool tr things you can do like that when you're in the hybrid land of having um, mixed continuous and discrete uh, uh, systems. So what I want to do now, um, you know, we talked about a little bit of, of modeling and a little bit of analysis on the Poincaré map last time, uh, but I want to now give us some of the tools to start doing some computation around this. So. Um, Let's say we want to find limit cycles. We want to optimize limit cycles. We want to you know, find the best limit cycles. How do we start doing that? Okay, so, um, you know,
how do we find limit cycles of these systems? So, um, you know, we started by talking about just a limit cycle of the smooth system, no contact, the Van der Poel oscillator, and that black line is the limit cycle. So how do we find that limit cycle? If we wanted a numerical representation of that trajectory, how would you find it? What would you do? Yes. Perfect, right? There's an obvious, for, for this one, there's like a, a natural strategy, which is uh, I'll just simulate it until I'm sort of numerically, um, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. Now, it's actually a, still a little subtle, right? Like, how do you know? I mean, if, I, don't, I can't even tell you the period of that. So even if I have a trajectory that's evolving and it starts repeating, I have to somehow recognize that it's repeating on, on some interval that they may not hit exactly. But, but I completely agree. You could simulate, you could, you could just basically truncate the last, you know, simulate it for a thousand seconds, take the last three seconds or something like this, and you might not land right on top of each other, but you'd have a, a, a pretty good representation of that trajectory. So that's a, that's a great choice. You can also find that trajectory by solving a, a small optimization, right? Uh, and in general, you know, for this system, we could just simulate. But for this system, right, finding that fixed point or finding that um, limit cycle, you can't just simulate. If you start from most initial conditions, the system just falls down. You know, well, actually, we don't simulate the ground, so it ends up hanging upside down and doing this weird, like, two legs swinging upside down like a pendulum. Okay, a uh, multi-link pendulum. Uh, so it's actually a very hard search problem to find that particular stable limit cycle, right? So compared to the vector field here, right, the, in that example, the basin of attraction is actually a very narrow band around this in higher dimensions, so I can't picture it as well. And all these other trajectories are veering off into something you don't want, right, or falling down. So in order to find this one thing, we actually have to solve some sort of a search problem. And trajectory optimization is, is a good tool for that. So, um, and I should say that this is actually, this is true in general. If you want to find a fixed point of a system, right? Even a, a, even a starter question, how do you find a fixed point for a complicated system, right? If you want to find uh, your quadrotor um, uh, equilibrium points or something like this, you know, that can also be solved by an optimization, right? If I have the dynamics x dot equals f of x u, I can write an optimization saying find me x and u such that f of x u equals zero. That's a good way to find stable points of, uh, of a humanoid standing, which requires maybe some torques in order to not fall down, right? So I have to search over X and U to find a quadrotor hovering, um, maybe against the wind or something like this. This is a general tool for finding fixed points. And for limit cycles, we can do the same thing. So now we'll try to find the continuous curve, right? As I'll, I'll write it in the slightly abstract way and, uh, first. So I want to find some trajectory um, segment, x, that has some derivative constraints, some feasibility constraints, that x dot had better be equal to f of x u on the trajectory. Let me even just keep it as the Vanderpool doesn't even have any actions, and neither does the compass gate, so, or the need walkers. So let me just leave it with X like this. And then I can say subject to X0 equals X of T final, let's say. <coughs> this is the periodicity constraint.
Now there's an important point that I want to make sure we get here. It was kind of hidden on the midterm, <laughs> right? But uh, you really need to have the time as a decision variable, right? I, in order to, to simulate this around and find a solution, I don't, if I don't know a priori what the duration of that trajectory is, then I need to allow the trajectory to stretch and shrink in time in order to, to solve that problem, okay? So I'm gonna try to search over paths X and the durations T, which I can do by you know, allowing those, um, each interval to, to stretch and shrink and become a decision variable. And you can write this, you can impose this with um, direct shooting, transcription, co-location, any of them will sort of satisfy that. Any of the methods we've talked about, ILQR can, kind of, can do these kind of things as long as the time, actually I guess ILQR with time expansion is a little bit weird, but uh, <coughs> um, certainly these three, you can, you can encode that constraint. And in fact, it's a pretty good way to find um, find those limit cycles. So here's the a few lines of code to find the limit cycles of the Van der Poel oscillator. I'll just do direct collocation. I'll make time a decision variable. Add constraints that, so that the times are the the each step is evenly is the same duration. That way they're evenly spaced. And then I just add the periodicity constraint, saying the initial state equals the final state, and solve. And I get these. I get my limit cycle out. It's actually I almost didn't put the dots. You know, you know, just I could pick my matplotlib line style, and I put the dots in, and it, it's, it's a good reminder, actually, that the dynamics are kind of interesting, where they, they slow down during that curve, right, and then they speed back up. The Vanderpool, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a neat dynamical system, okay? But that just comes right out instantaneously from a trajectory optimization, with, admittedly, a little bit of help. There's, I can justify why we need help, because if I only told it this, uh, the, this optimization as I've written it, then there's a trivial solution where x equals zero for all time. But the fixed point is also a solution to this optimization for any TF, okay? So we know that we need to at least somehow tell it which of the two solutions to find. I do that by basically giving it an initial condition, that or an initial guess of the trajectory that just is a perfect circle, like away from zero. You know, that was just the, the simplest initial con initialization I could say. Just make a circle. The timing is all wrong. It's certainly not the right shape. It's not even the right height. But it's just not the fixed point. And then the solver is able to push that out and find this solution. I actually wanted to give it even less. I wanted to just say, you know, that my initial conditions were somewhere up here. But SNOP gets stuck. It's still a nonlinear optimization. So I, the circle initialization was great. It worked, satisfying, but I wish it could just solve almost any sufficient description of the optimization. There are still times, even on this simple problem, where it says infeasible. Does that make sense? So that's a good way to find limit cycles, right? And we'll see it's going to apply to, to even the walking robots. Yes? I think I'm stuffing my foot in my mouth, but um, for the previous set, was when we were trying to like, guarantee, verify the reason of attraction for the inverse. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so this is a great question. So the, the question was, we, we um, 
we already pointed out on a problem set and in, uh, you know, in lecture about the, the region of attraction problem and the time reversed oscillator. And if this works so well, then why did we have trouble finding a really good region of attraction on the inside? So um, it's a great question. So, so the region of attraction code does not have privy to the information that you have, which is that we know that there's only a, a single fixed point inside there. And, and we're using extra information um, you know, to say that this, this must be the region of attraction. Um, it's a fair question of whether there are cases where we could encode that information in the optimization and, and help it out. But this um, for, feels to me like a particular case where we were able to exploit the geometry of the problem being in two dimensions. And you know, by, by inspection, we knew that that, that, that was the, uh, you know, that had to be the true region of attraction. Um, and most systems don't have the luxury of, I mean, it's possible that this would work for any system that you knew the fixed point was surrounded by a stable li limit cycle, you know? It's something like that. It's like, a, it's, it's, it's a qualified in that particular way. And there probably are other systems that are like that, but I don't think general systems are like that. Awesome. And please do ask, so especially today, ask questions. I actually, this is the one day I can't stay late for after class to answer questions. I gotta like bolt at four. But, uh, um, so ask questions during the, during the lecture. Okay, so you can imagine now that we're almost to where we need to do. Let's just find the rimless wheel limit cycle with the same sort of technique, right? So, it's gonna look like an almost identical optimization. Once again, the rimless wheel is so stable that we could actually just simulate forward and probably be fairly happy with it. There, in particular, since we have these events of the foot coming down, you could sort of simulate until the next event and have exactly a, the duration you wanted, okay? But I wanna think, I wanna work towards a more general toolbox here where we can use, right, for arbitrary systems that are described in this hybrid dynamics of continuous modes punctuated by discrete events. How are we gonna build um, optimization for tools, for systems like that? Okay, now remember the rimless wheel, the limit cycle we seek, it looked like, you know, it was in the land of the, um, the it had the dynamics of the, the simple pendulum, the dynamics followed this like this, and then had a reset. So we're looking for this sort of a <clears throat> solution. Okay, so we're gonna do the same sort of thing. We're gonna, um, we can even just make it a feasibility problem. Find me um, some trajectory x. The duration might be unknown. Subject to, you know, x dot equals f of x. This is the continuous pendulum dynamics. But instead of writing x0 equals xt final, what I wanna do is to say that xt final here, once it pushes through the reset map, is gonna land back at the original uh, state, right? It happens, if you remember, the, the reset map had a particularly simple form. It was cosine of two alpha, where alpha was the Two alpha was the, the leg, interleg angle times x of t, so I'll even say theta dot at time zero is theta dot at t final. This is the, um, this serves two 
purposes now. It's the periodicity constraint. And it's the, um, the impulse, you know, the, the event dynamics. The, uh, we tend to call it a reset map. Now there's a couple other things I need. If I'm going to let x move around, I also need to say that theta at time 0 equals it's got to be on this line. I'm going to peg the initial conditions to be on this line. So that's going to be gamma minus alpha and theta of t final with gamma plus alpha. That just happens to be the angles where the foot is just in collision on the top of the ramp and then just in the collision on the bottom of the ramp. Okay, That's just pegging the initial conditions and the final conditions to be on those lines. Okay, And then once again, I can fire up my favorite Co-location, shooting, whatever method. I want time to be able to, to stretch so that it can satisfy the dynamics precisely and land exactly from there to there. Okay. But this own, one little addition was enough to somehow make that solve the hybrid version of the problem. Same thing. A few, a few lines of, uh, you know, the initial state. Uh, the initial state was slope minus alpha plus alpha, but it's just a few lines of optimization, and it solves and it finds exactly the, the optimization or the limit cycle we wanted. Okay. That's a simple example, but actually that goes. That's going to go the distance. We can, we're going to be able to solve. You know, only a slight generalization of that idea, just making the finding the general form of that, is going to take us to solving pretty complicated problems. Okay, so make sure that resonates. Yeah. Let me actually show. Um, people have done very cool things. Uh, I would say this this type of optimization. Uh, it went through a phase, even in my career, of, of it being kind of like people were just getting it to work. To it was just a staple where people started to. Um, it wasn't just roboticists that were using it. Even scientists started using it. I would say, like you could, you could use this well enough to even s study the dynamics of simple models. For let's say, if you wanted to say something about human walking, you might make some simple models and and start using this tool to explore the optimality design space of, of human walking. And uh, one of the favorite, my favorite versions of that was actually a small extension in, in some ways of the models we already talked about. If you take um, the, those solid legs, they're still massless in this case, but you make a spring in the leg, then first of all, you can, you can hop, okay? Um, and that's what's happening at the top here. This is just like the compass gate robot we talked about. Um, with two legs, but now a springy leg, that allow, allows you to run, which, mean, which is hopping and running are, are almost the same for these models. Or it allows you to walk the same model with slightly different initial conditions and slightly different parameters of the stiffness of the leg. This, this um, is a great paper by Hartmut Geyer uh, showing that these models can, can do both. And <clears throat> Um, Manoj Srinivasan and uh, Andy Ruina took that type of model and started to extrapolate back to, to making statements about humans using optimization. So the, the slightly backstory here, um, our uh, McNeil Alexander was at Harvard for, for many years. I think he's the reason you guys have a bouncy track. Uh, you can run a running track uh, somewhere uh, at Harvard, right? Um, <clears throat> He did a lot of experiments on the efficiency of, of human running, human walking, uh, and there's these classic plots. Uh, this book is great if, you, um, if you're interested in these kind of things. But uh, So what the experiment is that you put humans on a treadmill, you measure their energy efficiency. The standard measure of energy efficiency is you measure the uh, CO2 coming out, so it's, it's, which is a surrogate for the, the uh, volume of oxygen they've consumed and then and somehow a, a surrogate for metabolic cost. 
Okay, so you, you put them on the treadmill, and there's two variants of the experiment. One of them is you let them self-select the speed, but you just tell them, um, uh, you, know, you ask, ask them to walk or run, but you let them self-select the speed. The other one is you, um, which is the first one here actually, is you set the speed of the treadmill, and you see what happens whether they choose to walk or run. Okay, this is the, the energetic cost as measured by these experiments of walking at slow speeds. Um, walking is pretty efficient, and then it goes up like this. Okay, um, <clears throat> at some point, the uh, you know running actually becomes more efficient as the treadmill goes faster. You know, you're just walking cra like crazy trying to keep up. At some point, you want to run. It turns out that they were able to predict your preference. You predict the point at which you transition from walking to running very well, if you, once you're allowed to pick, very well by, by the minimum of that curve, okay? So it, it turns out that people on average will, will sort of the average, uh, you know, subject here, prefer to start running right at this beautiful point where it became more efficient. That's not to say the only thing we're optimizing as humans is energy efficiency, but there's strong evidence, and there's much more uh, elaborate and, and sophisticated evidence now that supports this idea that we're doing a, we have a lot of work going on to minimize the metabolic cost of walking. When we're not like running for our lives, you know, like so, so if you're an animal, probably you care about efficiency last, right? If once you're not being eaten, once you're not being, you know, chasing your mate or whatever, uh, you know. But when other, all other things are equal, then go ahead, might as well optimize energy, right? So the cool thing is you take this very simple spring mass walker models, okay, and you just start running trajectory optimization. And you try to, you try to find what are the natural gates and the energetic costs for these spring mass mo model walkers. They seem way too simple, right? Humans are complicated. These are just simple spring mass models, okay? But they tend to have similarly a preference in terms of cost of transport and the minimum of the optimization problem, minimizing the total energy for walking at slow speeds and running at high speeds. There's a kind of a weird pendular run gate in the middle, which uh, they connected to some human experiments also. But the dominant one we want to think about is pendulum versus uh, running. And the curves they get out of these very simple models if you tune them to like the average subject mass and stuff like this, look very similar to the, to the, Malex the Alexander models. And this is a part of a theme actually where, where in locomotion people have really done a lot of beautiful work in running and in walking where some simple, mo very simple models explain a wide range of, of biomechanics data. It's a, very, uh, it's a very cool crossover sort of between um, robotics and, and uh, biomechanics, for instance. Okay, so they get these very, very similar curves out. And the fact that they started writing papers as if this was just, you know, we're just gonna explore the optimal solutions of a walking model. For me, that's like, oh, good, our trajectory optimization code worked well enough that they could forget about all the other, you know, it just assumed it was, we could just query the optimal answer. It was almost like it was an oracle, right? <clears throat> Okay, does that make sense? I could spend an hour showing cool animal videos of, uh, you know, in this, in that space. I've got some videos of a cockroach with a cannon soldered to its back. I've got videos of horses that run with their front legs and walk with their back legs and all kinds of stuff like that. It's fun to hang out with biomechanics people. Okay, so let's, um, let's think about the more general form of hybrid systems. And here's the this is, I would say, again, because the name is overloaded, I, I'm really talking about autonomous hybrid systems. Sometimes people will use the word hybrid systems for um, 
like driving a car where you can change gear, where a human can decide to change gears, and where if, if the control system is allowed to design the changes in the, in the continuous, you know, the events, that's a slightly different problem than if the world imposes by running into a, uh, the floor. Uh, and autonomous means, in some, it means that it's, uh, the, the world is impacting, is, is setting your hydrodynamics, roughly. Okay, so here's the, here's the general picture that I'd like you to have in your head is that solutions of autonomous systems have beautiful continuous trajectories punctuated by discrete events. So I'll call this like x1, x2 of t, okay? And we have language for all of these, um, all of these pieces. Okay, so this is the, these are called the hybrid guards. And we typically write them as a function that obtains its zero on this hybrid guard. So this could be, for instance, the distance between the foot and the ground. And really, we want it to be a signed distance to be useful. So we'd like it to be positive over here. negative over here, for instance. And then this here, the dynamics of this, we want to have an update law which says that the state after the impact is some reset map of the state before the impact. And we talk about the dynamics in each of these continuous phases as being inside a mode, a hybrid mode. This would be mode one, for instance. This would be mode two. Okay. So this is the basic language of hybrid systems, is you have hybrid modes, guards, and resets. And in that world, Certainly, contact mechanics fits nicely into that if we're using these um, impulsive models of contact. Okay, and many other uh, things will fit like this too. So, um, contact's a pretty good one, though. I was, I was, the, all, the four examples I just went through in my head were all actually just contact. So, uh, contact's a pretty good one, I think. And this is going to this is going to work for you know. For complicated systems, if I have my robot foot, you know, going into the ground, like I drew the other day here, right? So I really can just think about, for instance, writing one um, guard saying, for instance, that the the distance from this the heel to the ground is some distance, and it, if I say the distance goes negative after I go off the ground, and maybe I've got another guard here. I can have multiple guards in the, in the same mode. These are a function of, of position only in this case, so that's why I write Q. Okay, this would be the, the toe condition going to the ground. And you can, you know, every time my hand hits the, the grabs the a rail or something like this, I could write all of those possible collision pairs. So any, any pair of objects that might be in collision could have a sign distance describing that potential event and uh, a system that triggers on that event. And actually, the, the, a common mode sequence in walking is heel down, toe down, heel up, toe up, and then you also have to sequence that with your other foot if you've got just two. Okay, so you can imagine now, um, well, well, I should say even simulation of this is quite, um, it's quite interesting, actually. So um, there's multiple ways that we simulate the rimless wheel in Drake, for instance. So um, I can just 
make the simulation of a, of a wheel, drop it, and let all of our complicated contact solver figure out the forces. But the way that I did it in the example I gave you is uh, I actually explicitly saw, declared the guards and resets um, maps because I knew the equations. And you can write that and you can declare in a Drake system, you could say, I have a guard at this and it, in this callback function. And it'll take gradients of it. And it will do the, sim the integration scheme that's, that's integrating the dynamics forward in time actually does some sophisticated event detection, right? So it will, as it's simulating along, if it takes a step and sees that you had a zero crossing that changed the value of your guard from positive to negative, then we'll actually go back and take smaller steps in order to detect exactly the, I mean, up to some higher numerical precision, the location of that guard. And then it can get the event very, very precisely. Right? And that's a, um, you know, that's a, a level of, uh, of, simula of integration sort of accuracy that you can't get from a, a more general purpose physics engine. OK, and you can imagine now that writing an optimization problem, if I wanted to do trajectory optimization of a system like this, OK, I can say, for instance, I'm going to minimize x1, x2, and I could do any number of modes, right? I could do some cost function, whatever my subject to you know x1 dot equals f1 of x, even u if I, I've got it. x2 dot equals f2 of x. And a couple just generically useful constraints to say that um, if I know that I'm going to be transitioning from x1 to x2, then I can say that x1 at time of collision has to be equal to 0. That's a constraint I can add directly to my tra nonlinear trajectory optimization. Right? And I can say that x1. Um, Two at time collision plus is the reset map times x uh, one t collision minus. Let's say you can add extra costs, constraints, you know, torque limits, initial conditions, final conditions, periodicity constraints, whatever you want. But this is the language, you know, that choice of models maps of, of modeling, calling things a guard that have a zero level set and, and, uh, and a reset dynamics, that maps directly to an optimization problem. These are you know, uh, almost all nonlinear optimizations. Even the rimless wheel and the um, you know, Vanderpool. Yeah, I mean, so, so it, uh, there's really no limit where it becomes somehow a convex optimization especially if you have time scaling. That almost always breaks convexity. And in general, linear systems actually don't have stable limit cycles. A, li a linear system can only have a fixed point or be, you know, it can be a stable fixed point, a marginally stable fixed point or unstable fixed point, but that's it. It doesn't know, there's no sense of having a limit cycle in linear systems. Only nonlinear dynamics can have limit cycles. So these problems tend to be non-convex you know, those dynamics tend to be um, nonlinear and are all, all these time scalings and stuff like this, these tend to be non-convex optimizations. There are versions of it that we can make um, mixed integer convex when we get to it, but yes? So does this mean that we have to like choose a priori when it means contact? Because isn't that a very limiting thing, like if we see? Awesome. So the question is, um, have we chosen a priori when it makes contact? Okay, And so there is something very uh, reasonably limiting here, which is that we chose that we've a priori said that we are in mode one first, and then we make contact with this guard, and then we're in mode two. 
the amount, we can, all, we can parameterize time to stretch and shrink, just like we did in the Vanderpool and the Rimless wheel. So we did not have to specify, I mean, TC can be a decision variable. The time of collision does not um, have to be uh, specified a priori, but the order in this formulation is specified, okay? We will, in a future lecture, relax that, cons that assumption, but I, I wanted to actually emphasize that this time because in your projects, okay, for instance, you should try this first. <laughs> this, the, the, this is a technology that you can write science papers with. You can almost, the optimization almost falls away because it works very well. When I have to, when I make the problem harder by saying I actually want to discover which modes I'm in at the same time as optimizing the trajectories, we have codes that will do that, but they are much less mature and they will, they will struggle to find solutions sometimes. It, there, it's a better, it's a in, more interesting set of problems, but it's less mature, okay? So if you, and there are many problems, you know, a standard periodic gait of a human, for instance, it's actually not crazy to, to specify the mode sequence. If you can do that, if you're trying to do a kickflip with a, a skateboard, you could probably specify the mode sequence, right? And, uh, and that's gonna be a, a much better conditioned optimization. All right, so let's have a little fun with it. Um, I, was, I was trying to think of like the simplest examples of this, of, uh, um, of, the, of actually uh, exactly of this assumption that we're specifying the mode sequence. Okay, so imagine I'm gonna throw a bounce pass, or I'm gonna throw a, a, a pass with a basketball, okay? The optimization can think about the dynamics of the basketball, that's fine. But in this formulation, I have to tell it the number of bounces is basically, is the, it was equivalent, okay? So I have a parameter now that says, you know, find me a solution that goes from this initial height and some initial velocity, you know, at, at this location to there. In order to make the problem well-defined, I actually specify the total time. Otherwise, there's uh, arbitrary number of solutions. But I'm just going to do a, a pass. And <clears throat> with a simple optimization, the same mathematical program, I'm going to pass in the number of bounces. And then I also, in order to tell it which solution I want, there's a Z positive, Z dot positive, where I'm going to start throwing it up, and there's a Z dot negative where I'm going to start throwing it at the ground, okay? And if I'm willing to pick that number, which is a limitation, then this is number of bounces one, Z dot positive, then I can do a, you know, one-time bounce pass. I should be able to do zero, I hope. Yep, so I can, I could just arc it, you know? Um, I can do the one-time bounce pass, I can do the two-time bounce pass. I can choose the solution where I throw it into the ground initially to go. Um, and in general, you know, I can just loop through and solve that optimization for a bunch of different bounce passes, right? And I can all get all these different solutions that just boom, you know, I can I can really throw a basketball, um, you know, with these tools. It's a general. It's a general approach. When I started coding it up, I actually realized that um, since I'm not modeling the, the ground, uh, any friction with the ground in this way, I'm just uh, assuming elastic collisions, uh, I actually took, I removed X from being a decision variable. It, it doesn't affect the solution at all, right? So if I have a total time, I have a total distance, X is gonna be, X dot is gonna be constant. So I ended up just zapping that from the, the, the solution and it's really the same as just bouncing in place but that looks way less cool. So when I plotted it, I put X back in and, and, uh, and showed you that. And then I was thinking, okay, that's actually turned out to be too easy. So let me think of something cooler. And I went online and I found this guy, okay? Um, he like threw it up, bounced it, and then scored, right? And if you hear him, like, oh, that was three in a row. <laughs> so, um, so I'm like, okay, we could do that. So, but this time I had to, uh, I had to code up, now the collision with the ground matters, and the, of course, in order to bounce backwards, I needed some angular momentum in the ball, and I needed the, the collision dynamics of the angular momentum. So we derived that, and I'll show you the basic, I'll tell you where to look to, to find the derivation of that, okay? But yeah, so I just said initial conditions here, I said 
after some amount of time, you'll notice actually there's a lot more decision variables here than here because I chose badly I did, and I let time rescale, uh, but it, that's okay. So it, it picked a bunch of decision variables here, caused some big spin, it goes like this. Here's my solution, the basketball trick shot. Boom, there it is. So again, pretty much exactly the same solution. I hand-coded the, um, the dynamics of the ball, the pre and post dynamics to basically say that the second, before or the beginning of the second phase matches the end of the first phase modulo the collision dynamics. Okay? You can do all kinds of fun stuff. Three in a row, too, if you want. Um, <coughs> There's a general form for it. I won't derive it slowly on the board, but just know that in the appendix, there's the, oh, please go ahead. Sorry, how, how confident would you be if you could rig up like a flywheel or something to shoot the ball at that angle, no matter what the condition and that velocity, this would work out, or do you think there needs to be a bit more? That's a great question. So wh what's the sim to real gap here in this? Um, I think my model of the ball co um, collision is probably pretty simple. Uh, right, so I mean, I'm pretty sure, as long as the wind's not blowing, whatever, I, I'm okay with the aerial dynamics. Uh, the angular momentum um, at the gr at the impact between the ball and the wall and the ground would probably be a, th a function of you know, ball compressing, stretching in ways that conservation of angular momentum probably isn't capturing perfectly. So that would be that would be where I send a real gap would be, I think, in this. I think the quality of the solution, given the model, is, is fine. I would guess it's, it's, it's quite sufficient. That's a great question. We should try it. Um, OK, awesome that there's an extra cursor. But, um, so you can go through and, um, for a general form of the manipulator equations, if you want to compute these impulsive dynamics. Uh, it's, I did it one off for the rimless wheel. I actually even did it one off for the compass gate. I told you the story about conserving angular momentum, but there's a general form for that as you would expect. Um, the way to think about it is to think about you're doing um, an impulse is, is some amount of force that's applied over an infinitely small interval. It has to do some work in order to, to um, avoid uh, penetrating your, uh, your guard, okay? So given the language of the multi-body equations, given the language of the guard, then you can actually just solve for the pre and post velocities. You can add in a coefficient of restitution if you want, and you get, a, get these closed form solutions which look a little funny. They've got a pseudo inverse in the middle, but they're actually exactly the right thing to map a pre-collision velocity through a guard defined like this into a post-collision velocity. And for instance, if you wanted to, um, you know, when the need walker hit its kneecap and it affected the stance leg, right, that would have been hard to sort of work out with angular momentum arguments directly. But these equations just, just roll right through. And I actually even used it for the dynamics of the spinning bouncing ball to try to figure out exactly what the relationship was to the center of mass and the angular momentum when I have a collision, assuming that it sticks in the, and my assumption there was that um, the, there's no slip at the point, but there's an, you know, so it, it stopped, all energy, all rotational energy into the ground also stopped. And the rotational energy around that pivot could, could keep going. And then, um, yeah, it works right through the same equations and you can get your general solutions. Most simulators don't do this. In fact, I actually think it's, I don't think there's ever been, I know one like simulation code that sort of has the option to like simulate a, a, a reasonable rigid body system with hybrid dynamics, guards and resets. And it's not, it's not one you, you would know. It's, uh, but yeah, so, so most people don't have, um, and Drake doesn't either. Right? Drake does this, uh, you, can, you can write these, you, it makes it easy for, to write this for any one robot, but if you just give it a URDF, it does not yet, it could, it does not yet offer 
the, uh, the ability to sort of simulate with event detection for collisions and, uh, and you know, very accurate simulation like that. The reason is because if you start getting to really complicated things like a hand picking a chalk, for instance, you'd spend a lot of time working, a lot of, uh, a lot of events happen uh, during this. And even my roomless wheel, I remember, was, was having infinitely often, e infinitely frequent events. So the efficiency of these things doesn't scale. But the accuracy for both numerics and, uh, you know, and for simulation are the best you can do if you're willing to take those uh, impulsive collision models. That makes sense? Okay, so um, the same thing, I mean, this really does go the distance. Um, so this is a notebook that I, um, I, I referred a few of you to uh, as, a, as a useful thing to look at and works on deep note again. Sorry for the deep note just happened to go down right when I told people to look at it. Um, but the same optimization with just a few different modes, choices on the mode sequence can make, uh, you know, little dog. Yeah, this was little dog, um, which was, I should say, it was built for, by Boston Dynamics and we were programming it. Uh, this is a simulation of Little Dog. Uh, <coughs> and it was, if you know Big Dog from Boston Dynamics, Big Dog was like really cool and people were kicking it and then we got Little Dog. But that was still really good. Um, but yeah, so that's a, that's a notebook that you can just run. And um, I also, when I looked at it again, I realized I actually didn't completely finish transcribing my old code into the new uh, thing. So it does sort of silly things with angular momentum in the, the running gates, but I'll finish that. In like. But here you go. So write in your notebook, little dog. Um, start up MeshCat again here. And I don't know if you've really seen um, that MeshCat is actually a pretty good little visualizer. So if I just want to stand still, here's here's little dog, right? If you're on a slow internet connection, you'll be wish, you wish I didn't include all the texture maps and stuff, but I think it looks cool. You have red eyes, like it's going to take over. Um, yeah, so that's a simulation of, of Little Dog standing still. It felt I dropped it, and, it, and it's just running a PD controller. Okay, and then um, the gate optimization, just to make the point Richard made here, is that is it how restrictive is it to say you know the order of the gates? I would say that we've all, the name of the gate is actually synonymous with the ordering of the gate, right? The timing, of, of course, is a variable that should be solved for. But actually, if you look at a horse or a little dog and you say, you describe its gate, um, the name basically implies the mode sequence. There's this classic, you know, these classic gate diagrams of walking trots, rotary gallops, lateral sequence walk, transverse gallops, trotting, bounding, pacing, if you know the, the, all the equestrian um, gates. And you can write this gate optimization, which I just took in the mode sequence by a name string, and I apply the constraints based on um, which one I'm, I'm executing. And there, this is a, an interesting example. I think also the compass gate example that you guys do for the problem set this um, coming week is going to be a good example to work off of. <coughs> But with only a few differences, whether you're running, walking, on just the order and timing of the, of the feet, you write a, you know, admittedly long uh, optimization that talks about the friction cones, the center mass dynamics, angular momentum, okay? But when you get to the end, you run a quick optimization, there's nothing about the kinematics of walking or anything really it baked in there and off it goes it'll make your robot walk right same hybrid trajectory optimization it's walking a little silly because i don't have angular momentum in there kind of use that yeah i'll finish that <laughs> sorry <laughs> um there's a lot of code that we had like in an old version that was matlab and I've sort of, I, you might find me saying, yes, I have that. I just have to bring it to the new trig. 
Yes. So how, how, what's your counter dynamic choice if we say just put the paragraph in draft or span in C and we say that it's completely context bound and on the screen? Awesome. So the question is, you know, how, how impoverished is this uh, contact model, right? Uh, it, if I were to walk on grass or, or concrete or, or things like that. Um, <clears throat> this, so even on flat, hard terrain, I actually think soft contact models are more, uh, are, are more, more realistic in terms of what's happening. My foot is actually compressing, unless you're wearing. I actually tried making little metal sandals one time when I was trying to walk like Asimo, and it, it sucks. I mean, it, like, ski boats are bad, but like, actually strapping yourself to metal on, you know, it just doesn't, we don't walk like that. It, we don't make rigid collisions. Um, I almost broke my ankle and I don't recommend it. Um, so so I, do, I actually think there's elasticity everywhere, right? They are, there's also dissipation. So we're not bouncing all the time, but we're, and uh, you can fit that into these models. So there's a question of whether you summarize, you know, whether you summarize an entire contact event while your configurations don't change and you just say it's an instantaneous change of velocity. With more cleverness there, you can make higher fidelity models like that. At some point, for accuracy, you just want to simulate more details of the contact. And um, you know, we, we, we definitely, there's a lot of good work uh, you know, in the world on, on doing that. Uh, for trajectory optimization, we tend to use the simpler models to get the, make the numerics good. For simulation, we can do very advanced models. So, okay, if the grass, if I was walking in grass, I would, you know, I think already just changing the elasticity modulus, the dissipation parameters and stuff like that would probably work fairly well, right? Um, and these, do and the quadrupeds these days have like super light legs and uh, their center mass dynamics dominates and so they can kind of cruise through everything. Good question. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so there's one more important point I wanna make here that is, is going to be useful. So for the rimless wheel, I told you that we could write the entire dynamics in a single variable, right? We just needed a single uh, position and, and then a, some, a velocity, so theta and theta dot. How did I do it for little dog? That's what I want to talk through. I'll even leave it. Okay, so yeah, for the for the rimless wheel, we talked about writing everything with just, you know, Q was just theta, okay? <clears throat> if you think about trying to do that for little dog, that would mean every time, you know, or for any of these, uh, you know, any slightly more sophisticated things, every time my robot's in some configuration, I would have to solve a new set of equations in order to, to find the minimal coordinates of that uh, system given the new assumptions that my feet are pinned to the ground at certain places. That's not impossible, but that's a, not a standard operation, especially when you have multiple points making contact, because then you get kinematic closed chains and you have to do more work, okay? So um, there's another version of this. this. This one I would call minimal coordinates. Because I've taken the assumption that my foot is at the ground and I've written the absolute minimal state representation that describes these dynamics, okay? I could have taken the rimless wheel and instead thought of it as a system that could float in space. I could have said Q is X, Y, I like Z, X, Z, and theta. And then applied forces between the robot on the ground, okay, in order to imp effectively impose that constraint. So this would be a floating base coordinates. And you, 
can imagine that if my constraint is that my foot is in the ground, then I could just add that as yet another constraint in my optimization. Right? So you could choose to over-parameterize your equations of motion and add the constraints directly to the optimizer. Right? In fact, um, there's yet another choice here, which um, just as I, we're, we're using the, the words now, so um, if for the compass gate, where we had uh, multiple angles, I did theta 1 and theta 2. That was a minimal coordinates representation of the compass gate. The floating base representation would add x and z for the, the center of mass. It turns out since there's no body, I wouldn't need a theta, an extra theta for the body. You can even go farther. There is something called maximal coordinates. Where you would have a six degree of freedom in, in 3D or even a, a three degree of freedom description for every link separately. And then just tell the solver, oh, by the way, I've got a constraint here that's holding the legs together. So even your, your internal joints on your robot, you can, uh, they're just constraints. So you could write, um, have a floating base for every body. plus constraints for joints. That sounds kind of crazy, right? But you would be surprised how many game engines and simulators actually use that representation. Um, if you've ever, I, I don't want to pick on any one of them, but uh, uh, insert your favorite simulator here. If you've had your um, walking robot. So for instance, when we were doing a simulation in another simulator of Atlas, our total walking speed, our top walking speed, was limited not by the effectiveness of our controller, but by the fact that when we started walking fast, the knees started separating. The robot started f like pulling apart at the joints because the solver couldn't deal with the, the dynamics that we were generating. And there's kind of a thing that happens in simulators where you can, when the numerics get unstable, your robot can actually explode. Mm -hmm. Like links go in wrong directions and stuff like that. You're like, that eh, probably shouldn't have happened, you know? But uh, uh, if you see that, then you know you're using a simulator that does maximal coordinates. And you, it's, it's, not like, it's not like people are naive. These are very good simulators, but there can be very efficient ways to impose those constraints when you, when you take, and you can sort of like optimize the heck out of your particular floating base coordinate system and uh, you know, implement those constraints with a very fast solver. And that can be a good way to build a simulator. Um, but it does have funny numerical artifacts when things go wrong. And I think for control, it's not a great choice. And for trajectory optimization, I think anytime you can solve a way by doing, um, you know, by doing more minimal coordinates, you're going to win in terms of the numerics of your, of your optimization. OK, so, um, so how would we write an optimization with floating base coordinates? Turns out the equations of motion for a, a system that's making it. Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Um, isn't there ever any situation where you want to solve this optimization problem online for walking, or are these, are these just generated offline and only executed using like a Oh, that's awesome. So, so uh, the question was, do we ever want to solve these online? And absolutely, we do. Uh, people. Um, so there's there's two questions about whether you can solve them online. Certainly, it would be useful to solve them online. I think one question is, can you solve them fast enough? And I would think there's an abundant evidence now that people have been able to solve these very, very fast. Um, 
the codes that we give you in Drake are not the fastest available. There are people that have really uh, made very fast versions of these code. Um, <clears throat> the second one is how reliable is it, right? So if your stabilization depends on being able to solve it and it's a nonlinear optimization, then that's, um, then you have to decide if that, if you're willing to take the risk of the solver getting stuck, right? So for, uh, for convex optimization formulations of trajectory optimization, it is very common to solve those on the fly at very large scale. If you're controlling a chemical plant, that was when it, that's where it grew up because those are slow. Okay, but then increasingly people are doing very fast convex optimization in order to stabilize systems. Uh, the nonlinear optimization, I think, actually, you know, people, there's a lot of people that, that, that use that in serious applications. Absolutely. We didn't, this is the, the thing I said earlier was that we didn't do it in the DARPA challenge on Atlas because I was afraid the robot would fall down if it failed to solve the optimization. So that was where my threshold was, uh, was hit. Okay, so um, just like there was a general way to uh, compute the inelastic uh, collisions, given the multi-body equations, there's a sort of a general way to work in floating base and add these constraints of the form my foot is in contact with the ground, okay? Um, <clears throat> and this one's worth talking about because it's gonna be our, our exit strategy when we, have to, when we wanna solve the problems uh, that also discover the mode sequence. Okay, so <clears throat> you should think about these contact forces as, um, as solving some sort of constrained equations of motion. So I've got the ground, I've got my rimless wheel. I'll, I'll just do a compass gate so I don't have to draw so much. My compass gate that's floating now, okay. Um, there's, in my mind, there's two important possible collision pairs. There's the, this foot and this foot, and they're, each of them are only allowed to collide with the ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna parameterize that force the force on the ground doesn't matter. The ground's not going anywhere. It's got infinite inertia, okay? But I'll make that F1, F2. And I'll notice that the equations of motion in my manipulator form the forces always enter in a special way, okay? There's, if there's multiple forces, I'll just sum them up, okay? The forces actually enter the multi-body equations. In an affine way, we'll exploit that more in other optimizations. In the nonlinear trajectory optimization, it's cool, but it's not an essential, okay? The contact forces always come in in this um, affine way, which is not surprising, right? It's F equals MA. Still, the, this Jacobian here is often called the contact Jacobian. It has the beautiful interpretation that it's the gradient of, it's actually when, especially when the guard is this function of Q, it's just the gradient of my guard function for the normal force at least. Okay, so we can solve that very easily for that contact Jacobian. It, it doesn't, it's not surprising that if the, the distance function here I'm gonna blow it up a little bit here. I've got a, a big robot foot here. The distance, the sine distance function is, um, its gradient is always gonna be in the normal direction of that contact, okay? And taking the gradient all the way through to Q also has the effect of transforming it from a Cartesian coordinate into the joint coordinates. So we have this contact Jacobian that enters but the most essential point is that it, we know how to add these forces into the equations very naturally. So the way I actually did it in Little Dog and the way that you'll 
I think probably find very useful in general is you can actually optimize um, the forces as an extra decision variable. You could say I want to optimize x, maybe my u, and then actually make the forces a decision variable too. Some long-term cost. You could put cost on the forces if you want. OK. And then I'm going to subject to all the constraints we've talked about, plus a new constraint saying that the force is 0 in my non-contacts modes. And um, phi of, of q equals 0 in contact modes. And this becomes a very general recipe that you can, if you, when I wrote the, that's why I could write one script for little dog and the equations were all the same. I didn't have to make different dynamic models for different parts of the, of the gate. I wrote the same dynamics down and I just had a branch in the, at the end saying that for each time segment, if I think the foot's supposed to be on the ground, then I set it, the distance to the ground to be zero. And if I think the foot's supposed to be in the air, I don't add that constraint. Maybe I could say it's above the ground, but I said force has to be equal to zero. And this gives you a very general recipe if you're in the floating base coordinates for, for writing these, these optimizations. Yes? You, you said you could add the constraint that the foot be in the air. Do you have an, that would change the behavior of the nonlinear optimizer. Do you have a sense of whether that would help or hinder? Um, so of course it depends on the, the robot and everything, but uh, if you, for instance, optimize, so you know, I know you asked the question about optimization about the optimizer, but in terms of the, the type of solutions you get for a walking robot, um, where you have any objective for trying to be efficient, if you don't start adding things like that, the robots will almost always drag their feet. <laughs> in fact, it's a it's a tell. I think uh, you know like. You could tell if uh, somebody's got extra terms in their cost function or whatever. Like, yeah, All, every sort of uh, optimization I've seen trying to minimize energy, you get these kind of like scuffing, barely scuffing, which would be a bad thing to try to stabilize. Uh, it doesn't have any notion of robustness, right, that, that solution. So adding some sort of like get off the ground helps with the rest of the application. In terms of the solver, um, I suspect that it, only a good thing. I mean, just to restrict it to one side of the, uh, you know, one side of the solution space. I would guess there's probably weird things that could happen to your dynamics underneath, um, you know, if you get it under the ground and stuff like that. So I would be inclined to always include it. But I don't know. The solvers, you know how, how finicky solvers can be. Yes? So we can, um, so in the same way, I was, I was, I should have written the whole table. You know, I could say, or phi of q greater than zero. I could say, don't be in contact explicitly. Maybe greater than or equal to some epsilon even. And then similarly, correct. You'd want to say, or force greater than uh, equal to zero, because you could allow, you could, you could have zero force, but you're not allowed to pull on the ground. Absolutely right. But this is a way to uh, explicitly encode the mode sequence, leaving almost all of your optimization uh, intact, except for those one set of constraints. Richard, did you have another question? Yeah, so um, I was just wondering, like, when you have, like, um, so maybe the case is when you have two objects that are, like, in contact at, like, a vertex, and it's not, like, plane, vertex, or plane to plane, how do you define, like, the direction of the Yep. Um, so you're, you're saying if I have two points colliding, um, or if I end up, there are, yeah, yeah, right. Two points probably won't collide, but, but these things could find themselves uh, 
for instance, if you're stacking, uh, right, you might find yourself landing on the corners. Yeah, so um, this is where the difference between uh, an optim a, a collision engine that's been built for optimization versus one that's just built for simulation starts to matter. So um, the sine distance functions that you that you would get just naively would have a you know would have some noisy stuff happening in the corner, and uh, but one can write a level set that is perfectly smooth around there. You could think about um, yeah you can you can write functions that handle those discontinuities okay and have sub level sets. And the gradients of the sublevel sets, you know, th this would be a, a form of a sine distance function that is perfectly smooth and would give you good normals, even in the in the corners. The harder case actually is when you have penetration when you're inside when the two boxes are inside, because then the um, you're very you're very much in danger of having a normal pointing out in this space and another normal pointing out in this space at neighboring points. And so smoothing the inside of the box is actually worse, in my mind, than sp smoothing the outside of the box. And this is also a, a place where, which lead to the robots blowing up in your simulation. Yeah. Or, I mean, yeah, so if you're doing exact event detection, you can avoid it. But as soon as you're doing any time-stepping type method, you will, you will have some penetration. So the last point to make about this um, is that uh, the dynamics here plus the constraint being equal to zero actually implies what the forces have to be. So you can, you can even solve for the contact forces and the optimizer can solve from the contact forces because when you, um, in order to solve for them explicitly on the board, you would take advantage of the fact that phi dot of q would also be zero in that regime, and phi double dot of q equals zero. And this gives you a set of equations that depend on q double dot, which implies the solution to the forces. So we have general ways to compute the, the contact forces that you can tell the solver about, and everything works. So this would be, in my mind, Using force as a decision variable is a convenient way to do floating base um, constructions. And there's general ways to, to relate the force to x's in order to satisfy the equations. Most of its details, you know, I, that which are either coded for you or they're in the appendix, whatever. But I think at a high level, I do think it's very important that you understand that these floating base coordinates are, are I think, the mainstay, certainly for legged locomotion. Good, yes? Sorry, um, what about when we're setting the gun function to, to be zero? Yep. Why does that not force us to want to make contact, second contact? This would only be in the contact mode. It, in the regime where you say, I am in contact, right. then you can impose that. So then? Not at the transition. So that, that's the beauty of, so, so this is a great question. I th and I, I hope I'm answering yeah. your question, which is that, the, the uh, reset map, so, so the transition dynamics are all tucked away into the reset map. So you really can think, once I'm in the mode, I am actually in the mode, I'm, I'm handling this exactly. As soon as I've got a lift off force, I actually enter another reset, which gets me out of this. And then, you know, it doesn't imply anything about the forces anymore, and I remove those constraints. Uh, so that's a great, great question. So not instantaneously, but you can get have inertial. This is all. This is actually true even in forward simulation. Um, the way people solve for, for forward simulation, you kind of have to have an inertial effect pull you out of contact. That's a, that's a very very good point. Mm -hmm. One other question I saw. No? Yes. Yeah. Do we have to tune it? Yeah. No, those are typically given from geometry. That's like the, uh, for, for at least for the standard contact models, this is like my collision engine tells me the sign distance between two objects, and I'm going to take the gradient of it for my, you know, for my contact model. But those are just the geometry engine doing the work for you. 
you know, for other systems where you have, you, you might use creativity to make that, those models work, but for contact mechanics, those are given. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna 